All right. All right. Welcome back to Tuesday. It's Blog Chat. I'm Matt, and this is Chris. I should <laughs> by now I should know which way to point. That way. Oh. Welcome back. See, well, it's, it's it's confusing. It's, it's, it's a mirror. Uh, it's a mirror. Yeah. yeah. Just go like this. <laughs> They went that away. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, everybody. Good to see you oh. again. There's my lens. There's the people. And say hello in the chat. Let us know where you're tuning in from. We love hearing about that. Um, tonight is uh, is a blog post I really, really love. When I saw this image that uh, the Chris led the blog post with, I had to comment and say, uh, I, I forget what I said. There were probably expletives, but I'm totally in love with it. It's just a beautiful image. It and was a very sincere compliment. I, oh. I remember it was a sincere compliment. I don't remember exactly what you said, but it wasn't like, you know, oh, good job. You know, it was, it, I could tell you meant it, so I appreciate it. I'm pretty sure I cursed in appreciation. <laughs> <laughs> Something like that, maybe? Yeah, all right. <laughs> anyway, wow. So, um, you, you have this wonderful story about how you get the shot and, it, and there's multiple acts to it, right? Yeah. Yeah. You know, it was, it was one of those nights, you, you know, as a photographer, you, you know, you, you, you do your thing. Right. And most, most uh, shoots are like most other shoots, but sometimes you get a really special uh, night in or a day in or whatever. And, and this was definitely one of those occasions. Um, I did this photo uh, with, James, uh, who was one of our uh, workshop attendees in Yellowstone. Uh, in fact, James has been on a bunch of workshops. Um, he's he's great. Uh, anything we do with the word backcountry in it, he's probably going to show up. Um, <laughs> and, and other things too. But uh, James and I kind of uh, worked on this together and uh, we were trying, you know, we were doing something else and then the opportunity popped up. You know, we can get more into the details. But, um, you know, it's just an example of just being in the right place at the right time, uh, not completely out of luck because there was scouting involved, um, but that everything just came together in a perfect way and we were prepared. We already knew what we were doing and we just fired. And we were, both of us were just so fired up about having gotten this, um, you know, uh, God bless digital that we were able to look at the back of the camera and see what we did because we were just, you know, uh, riding on air the rest of the night. I, I can understand why. So, so the, the, the walk walk me through this. How so? You guys got this shot while other people at the workshop were doing. Uh, first off, where the heck are we when we see this image? I don't think we said where this is. Uh, we didn't, um, but we're in Yellowstone National Park, um, which you, you, if you had guessed, you'd have a fifty fifty shot. If you see a photo of a geyser. You can guess Yellowstone and you have a 50-50 shot because half the geysers in the world are in Yellowstone. Mm. Uh, but this is a white dome geyser, which uh, is it was one of my it's one of my favorite geysers to shoot. Um, it's not the biggest in the park, um, but for photography, it's really good. Um, and I tell the story on the blog about how I first came across it, it was back in 2010. I was going on a, a, a 10 day shoot in Yellowstone and an idea that I had beforehand was to silhouette a geyser eruption in front of a sunset or a sunrise. So uh, I was putting a lot of thought into that idea before I went on the trip and uh, f figured I needed three things to pull that off. I, I needed a geyser that was gonna erupt relatively frequently um, because a lot of them go off you know, every couple of days, every few weeks. I mean, there's ones that don't go off for decades at a time. Obviously, that wasn't going to work, right? Uh, I also needed a geyser that was going to erupt predictably. Uh, so a lot of the geysers, they'll say uh, it's going to erupt at, they'll, they'll predict it's going to erupt at six o'clock tonight, uh, give or take six hours, you know? Uh, so that wasn't going to help, right? Because I'm trying to time the shot for a sunrise or a sunset. Right. Uh, but then the other thing I needed was some sort of aesthetic quality to the geyser because I wanted to silhouette it. So just a hole in the ground wasn't going to work. I needed something with some structure to it. So with those criteria in mind, I researched uh, the geysers uh, before going. This was all pre-shoot scouting. Um, you know, I read up on the geysers and the eruption times and the intervals and all that. And the target that I settled on was white dome geyser because um, it hit all those criteria. It it erupts frequently on average about every half an hour. 
Uh, it's predictable. It doesn't usually miss an eruption. Uh, when it does, it's, you know, usually misses by 10, 15, 30 minutes, maybe, um, which is nothing compared to how much uh, uh, variability there is in the eruptions of the other geysers. Uh, but then one of my favorite things is it had that aesthetic quality. It's got that dome. There's this 12-foot dome uh, center cone uh, that's sticking out of the ground. So that was great to silhouette, right, because now I can get the sun behind that. And there's just a lot of structure. So that's everything that went into this shot 10 years ago. Um, and it took me a few tries, but I was able to get something that looked like what I wanted. Uh, and then I never forgot about this geyser. You know, whenever I was in the park and had some idea for a photo, um, like I wanted, you know, I went back and shot this in moonlight a couple years later and uh, things like that. So, all right, now fast forward. There's your backstory. Fast forward to 2020. Tim and I, uh, just this past September, were leading our Yellowstone workshop. And uh, as, as we always do, you know, we got there a few days early uh, and we were scouting ideas, uh, you know, to bring the group to. Uh, and one of the things that we thought is, oh, we should try to find a geyser that we can get the Milky Way behind. Um, now, Old Faithful was one that we could do. We had scouted that. We knew we could shoot the Milky Way behind Old Faithful and Castle Geyser, which is um, just a walk from Old Faithful. We knew that too. Um, but we were down scouting near White Dome as well. And the uh, that's on Iron Hole Lake Drive, uh, which is uh, it's about a half hour north of the Old Faithful area. Uh, but we knew we wanted to shoot there one night uh, just down the road. Uh, it's a few hundred yards walking distance is Great Fountain Geyser, which is one of the most beautiful geysers in the park to shoot because it's got this huge... Um, hot spring, uh, the pool, the shallow pool that fills with water uh, within the hour or two before it erupts. So you can get really nice reflections in that, as you can imagine. It's a beautiful spot to shoot. Uh, so we went and scouted that to shoot that in moonlight, and we, we, knew, we, we knew we could do star circles behind that, um, which was going to be great because Great Fountain Geyser has sort of circular patterns in it. Uh, mm. So we figured we could kind of mirror the star circles with that and all that. Um, but while we were there, I was like, hey, Tim, we get, let's go check out White Dome Geyser, too, for all the reasons that I just mentioned, right? So if we wanted to uh, shoot an eruption and maybe light paint it, uh, then that would be a good target because we would know that we would get a shot at it like every half hour. Um, and while we were scouting it, we walked all over to the north side and um, took out photo pills and saw that we could also get the Milky Way behind it. Uh, so again, this is all pre-workshop stuff. You know, this is not to get into the sausage making of a workshop, but this is what we do, right? So we spend right. two or three days at the park looking for photo ideas that we can share with the attendees when they get there. Uh, and this and this was one of them, you know. Uh, so we knew uh, the moon was going down at about uh, 9.30 that night. And um, uh, so we could see with photo pills that the Milky Way would be behind it. And uh, we didn't make a point of getting that photo. It was more just, okay, here's another opportunity, right? So we took a note. We knew, you know, we've got like 20 different photo ideas before the workshop starts. And this was just one of them. Uh, so that's kind of the backstory of how we knew it was possible. Um, but uh, as I explained in the blog post, uh, it wasn't even, you know, it wasn't even the, the big shot we were going to do that night. Um, we, you know, we needed, in order for a Milky Way photo to work, uh, you need the moon to go down, right? Um, of course, there's caveats, as you wrote that great blog post a few years ago about being able to use the, the, the polarizer, uh, and you can see the Milky Way in a moonlit sky. You know, but ideally, like if you're really looking for a Milky Way shot, you don't want the moon hanging around. So we, we got to the location and... Um, it was going to be, you know, a few hours before the Milky Way, any Milky Way photo was possible. So the, um, the, the first thing we did is, you know, we said if, if anybody wants us, you know, wants to see us walk through a demo, a photo, uh, we have an idea for star circles over Great Fountain Geyser. So that's yeah. something that, that we could set up in twilight and everybody could focus. And, um, you know, we taught about exposure, about how do you figure out exposure for uh, a star stack in moonlight. Um, and the, the entire group wanted to do that, right? Uh, so 
you know, we never tell people, okay, line up and point here and here's your exposure. Uh, but sometimes we do a demo and we give people the option. We say, hey, we've got this photo idea. And this happened to be a rare night where just, you know, every person on the workshop loved the idea and they wanted to be part of it. And so the whole group was uh, lined up on the south side of Great Fountain Geyser. Um, and we walked through how to do this photo. Uh, so I talk about that a little bit in the blog post, but I wanted to, I can actually show you that um, because I've got Tim's photo. I emailed him this morning. And uh, this, uh, can you see the, the photo here? Yep. So this, so this is Tim's shot of the star circles over Great Fountain Geyser. So you can see there's like the circular patterns on the bottom. Beautiful reflection because that water wow, is wow. just hardly moving. It's such shallow water um, and there was no wind. So, uh, so this is what we were working on. And this was, um, I, I don't know how, Tim, how long Tim went for. We were advising people to go for a minimum of an hour. Um, so, so that's the shot that everybody else was doing. Wow. Um, during this, uh, I went over to, uh, to white dome geyser, um, because I also knew from our earlier scouting that this photo was going to be possible. Um, so, you know, the Milky Way shot, we're on the North side, but you could also get on the South side of the geyser. And, you know, I said, okay, you know, we can put the North Star up here too. And um, nobody else was interested in this wow. photo, uh, which was fine. You know, I just went up and I, I just went and set my camera up, uh, took a few minutes, and then I went back and joined the rest of the group at Great Fountain Geyser. Mm -hmm. uh, the reason I mentioned that is because after, I want to say like, you know, an hour and a half, I wanted to go get my camera back. Um, and by that point, the moon had set. Uh, and James, um, you know, was standing next to me, uh, and I told him I'm going to go up to Great Fountain, uh, and he asked if he could come with me, and I said, yeah. So uh, he took his second camera, and we went up to Great Fountain together, and um, uh, I'm sorry, up to uh, White Dome Geyser, uh, and I don't know if he'd been there yet, but he thought it was pretty cool. He, he set up and did a few photos. Uh, we light painted a little and blah, 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 so we did a few things. Uh, but right before we left to go back to the rest of the group, I had mentioned that when Tim and I were there a few days before, we did check with photo pills and saw we could get the Milky Way behind it if we went to the north side. Uh, now, the trick with this geyser and a lot of the geysers is that you can't walk anywhere you want, um, you, you know, because the ground is unstable. So you, you can't just go set up the camera where you want. So when I say that we scouted and we knew we could get the Milky Way behind it, what I mean is we could get the Milky Way behind, behind it while standing someplace safe and legal. Uh, and that was from the very edge of the road that uh, passes up behind the geyser. Um, so we went over to that side and uh, sure enough, uh, there was the Milky Way and uh, the geyser was, was steaming. Um, as you can, you know, uh, you see there's the three photos that I included at the blog post um, that we just shot, right? We figured out the light painting. You know, we weren't waiting for an eruption. Uh, just the steam is pretty by itself. And, um, you know, we just figured out the light painting. We wanted a little bit. We didn't want to overwhelm it. And, I, you know, we kind of felt like that first photo, there was too much light um, yeah. and not quite enough in the second one. And then in the third one, we... You know, we found that Goldilocks zone for the light where we're adding just enough to bring out the foreground, but uh, sort of letting the edges of it trail off into shadow. Um, and we got a little bit of steam there. and The Milky Way looked great. Um, and we were happy. I mean, that was the shot that we had in mind. Um, we weren't we didn't have any thought at all about waiting for an eruption. Um, but. We got that third shot and we said, yep, that looks great. And we were just about to break down the cameras when we heard the geyser start to go off. And uh, we just we couldn't believe our luck. It was just like, oh, well, we already know the shot, right? The cameras are set up and they're focused and we just figured out the light painting. So all we had to do was jump back into action and do the photo again. Uh, and we were able to get off um, two or three photos. Uh, these are the two that I thought were the best. Um, the eruption at White Dome lasts about two minutes. So if you're shooting in daylight, you can 
you know, you, you have plenty of stuff you can do. You can change angles yeah. and, and all that. Yeah. You don't have that luxury at night when you're dealing with, um, you know, about a 20 second exposure. Right. Um, and, and when I say that the eruption is two minutes, the whole eruption is two minutes. But as you can imagine, it, it sort of tapers up and then that does a slow taper down. And the best part of the eruption is usually that top of the curve, uh, which only lasts for maybe 20, 30 seconds. So when the eruption is at its best, you're lucky if you can get two photos in um, mm -hmm. during a night during a night shoot um, before the you know before the water level drops. Um, so you can see like the photo on the left, that's when the geyser was at its highest, yeah. um, and that was really the sweet spot in terms of the height of the water. Um, but the one at the right, I liked better. That's the photo that's featured in the blog post. Uh, and the reason, sorry. I do too, very much, yeah. And and the reason is because, yeah, it's, I just thought it was really pretty how the, the water was kind of feathering off. Uh, there was just a slight breeze um, and it, you know, sort of that, that wafting of the steam is mirroring the shape of the Milky Way. And, you know, there's no way I can plan that. Um, you know, it's like when you shoot anything with blurred water, if you're shooting waterfalls or uh, shooting along the shore, um, or even like shooting, you know, flowers that are blowing in the wind. Anytime you're dealing with motion, it's kind of a crapshoot, right? And it, it, there's only so much you can plan. And then when you go in the Lightroom afterwards, you look at the photos that you shot and figure out which one was best, right? And, yeah. and so that was the case here. That's that's why I liked that that second one. Um, yeah, right. And and James and I just couldn't. I mean, we were high fiving and. We might have even hugged. Uh, it was, you know, because both of us just got this incredible photo, and and like I said, it wasn't completely luck. You know, the the location was scouted. Um, right. We we knew what we were doing. We had already tested. We didn't realize we were shooting test shots, um, but essentially, that's what those first three images were were test photos. And then we just had the luck of the geyser going off while we're standing there still set up. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, so you know that's. That's the, the the first or the second act of the story. I guess that's the second act of the story, right? Um, and that and that was that was the shot I was happiest with uh, from the night. So then you so showed then those you pictures to everybody else. else. Yeah, because um, we like I said, we were both pretty excited, and uh, we went back to the rest of the group, and um, you know James started showing people. You know, I went up to Tim and I showed him my shot, um, but James was going to the other attendees and was like, oh, you're not going to believe this. You're going to see this photo we did and blah, blah, blah. And everybody just thought it was great. You know, they, um, and a, a lot of people at that point, it was at, um, by the time James and I got back, it was maybe 1130, um, 11, 1130. And a lot of people were breaking down for the night already. Uh, but there were uh, four other people who you know, said, oh, gee, would it be possible to, you know, for us to get that shot or did we miss the opportunity? And I was like, oh, no, this geyser goes off like every half an hour. So if if you're willing to stay up late, yeah, let's let's go check it out. And if I stay up late, I'm thinking, okay, maybe it's going to take another 30, 40 minutes, you know, get set up and then we'll wait for it to go off. We'll get the shot and then we're out, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, it did not go as easily the second time. Um, for uh, a couple very, for a couple different reasons. So we got set up um, about midnight, you know, and, and we're ready to shoot. And we waited, I want to say maybe 15, 20 minutes um, uh, for the geyser to go off again. Um, this time we had two lights going. Uh, we had, uh, we were using Luxley violas. Uh, we had one on each side, you know, just laid them on the ground. And we did our test photos and we had a lot more time to work than James and I did the first time. Um, but uh, Jason was there and Brian, um, uh, Christina, Tim was there, you know, so there were, there were, let's see, seven of us total at that point, including Tim and I. Um, and so we didn't have to wait too long for the geyser. It went off and we start firing. And right as the geyser got to its best, um, Somebody had the Luxley Composer app open on their phone. Um, 
you know, which was fine. Um, and I don't know if they hit it by accident or if they didn't know what that button did or whatever, but all of a sudden, <laughs> all the light, both lights turn blue. I mean, just bright, gaudy blue. <laughs> and um, another, I, I don't, I, I shouldn't say the word gaudy. That's a very judgmental word. Um, there are people who shoot for this effect and I have no problem with that from an artistic standpoint, but it's not what we were trying to do. Um, neither Tim nor I shoot like this deliberately. Uh, none of the five of us do. It's not our style. True. Um, and the, the, the five participants, the five workshop participants who were there weren't looking for this either. Uh, it was just a total goof that had happened at just <laughs> exactly the wrong time. And so it blew the shot. And here we are at 1230 and we're like, oh, we can't believe we just stayed an extra hour for this and didn't get the photo. So, um, you know, but everybody was excited about the possibility, right? So we decided and nobody was arguing at that. You know, let's just stay. You know, we're already set up. We know the lighting and, and that's just, just, we'll just stay. It shouldn't be too much longer. You know, again, it's like an average of a half hour interval for this geyser to blow. So, you know, we're enjoying each other's company and there's stars. We're in a national park and Yellowstone, right? So we really can't complain. Right. And um, so we waited. Uh, but it took a little while. It was... Um, I forget. I say the exact time in the blog post, but I want to say it took about an hour. Sorry, what? One twenty. Yeah. Okay, so it took almost an hour for it to go off again. Fifty minutes. So it was uh, it was running late. Um, so we were getting tired, but it was okay. Uh, and but here's the big problem: the second time is so far the entire evening. We, we talked about the breeze before, right? And the, the breeze was kind of blowing to the right of the frame. And that's what it was doing all night until I would say it was two or three minutes before the geyser went off at 120, the wind shifted and everybody was set up to have the Milky Way in the left of the frame and the geyser on the right. And <laughs> so as soon as the wind shifted, the steam started blowing and blocking the Milky Way. And sure enough, boom, that's when it goes off. So, uh, we missed it. You know, it was, you know, it's still an okay photo, but it's not what we were looking for. Um, and because we'd now we'd had two failures and it was one thirty in the morning, we just said, forget about it. You know, we're, we're, we're done. Um, we, we can't stay and wait up for, for another eruption. Um, and it was unanimous. Like I, nobody, nobody felt like waiting up for it. Um, but the funny thing was nobody packed either. <laughs> so we're just, again, we're just out enjoying the night sky. And, you know, we were kind of bummed, but we're kind of laughing at the bad luck too. And um, it, about, I want to say like 20, 30 minutes goes by. And Tim and I were like, you know what? Do you get the feeling that we're waiting for it to erupt again? <laughs> and uh, yeah, so I don't know if it was just a subconscious choice that everybody made or or what, but there was a point when we, it was obvious that we were waiting for it again. Um, uh, fortunately, so it was a little after two, uh, 2 a.m. and the, the, the water started going again. Uh, we were all still set up. You, you can see too how the Milky Way was kind of changing orientation during the night. So there was a really nice tilt to it at this point. Um, and, and we got it. Uh, this time, nothing changed with the light. Nothing changed with the wind, um, <laughs> and it it just went perfect. Um, and there was there was definitely euphoria again because you know at this point everybody in that group had been invested in this photo for two and a half hours, and starting you know to set up at like eleven thirty at night. Right. Uh, so there was definitely a, a sense of. Uh, relieved suspense, right? Um, yeah, yeah. And everybody was really on a high, you know, and everybody's high-fiving each other. And uh, it was a lot of fun. It was some of the most fun that I've ever seen a group have uh, on a workshop. Um, you know, just just that it was a third of the group that stayed to shoot it. And um, yeah, it was just a really good time. And I think everybody went home with, I think that that was one of those occasions too, where you know that night that that's going to be your best shot of a trip. 
Um, <laughs> you got three nights left, but you know you're not going to top it. Uh, and that was, I think that was the feeling that everybody had. Uh, it was just, it was such a great experience. I love this I love story. This story. I love it was it. fun. It was fun. Yeah. You would have had a blast. I wish you were there. It was cool. I, 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 I mean, and then I get to yeah. this. Um, wow. 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 Yeah. Yeah. It was so, good. So, yeah. our first question, first question mm -hmm. that we had come in was single shot, single shot high ISO. ISO. Yes. Um, so, we were, everybody was shooting single shot, um, and it was a star exposure uh, because we needed to get the Milky Way. We wanted to freeze the stars, uh, we didn't want them moving. Uh, so, you just think of it as a, as a, a Milky Way exposure. Um, and in this case, I, I was shooting with the with, with the IRIX 15 millimeter, uh, and I pushed it to 25 seconds. Um, I normally would shoot at about 20 seconds with that, maybe even 15. Uh, but but I wanted to to really push the the limit of the shutter speed so that I could make sure that I get it got a good uh, a good column of of water. Um, and then uh, from there, it was just determining the light painting. Um, so one of the things that uh, I love about the, the Luxley Viola is that you can dial it down to 1% power, and that's where we had it. Um, because shooting at ISO 6400, you add just a little bit of light, and that sensor just sucks it all up. Um, so you, you, know, you can't put a lot of light on it. Um, when we did, uh, so when James and I did the first photo, we're standing pretty far back because, again, it's a geyser and it's uh, volatile ground around it. We can't walk right up and light it. So we were standing, um, I want to say, might have been 100, 150 feet back. Um, and with the Luxley at 1%, we were lighting for about half of the exposure. Uh, when we went back with the, with the group and had everybody, uh, we put two Luxleys and we kept them on during the whole exposure. Um, but we had uh, feathered them up. Um, so um, the first shot when James and I were doing it, we were moving the light during the exposure. But the, the second time out with everybody else, the lights were stationary. There were two of them and we feathered them up. And that's how we, um, you know, uh, dropped the intensity of, of the light um, right. by just using that fall off as the light's pointing up like that. It's beautiful. Thanks. Um, no starry landscape stacker that wouldn't work here. That would be interesting. Uh, you, the problem would be the steam. You would, uh, if you use starry landscape stacker, you would need to layer in that steam shot, uh, which is which is possible. Um, I think that the tricky thing is because you're layering in the steam and the the water column. Any of the stars that were behind that. Uh, would be, you know, they would look like they were shot at ISO 6400. And anything with the starry landscape stacker, you know, say you got it down to look like 400. If you looked closely, if you zoomed in, you would see the difference um, mm. between the stars behind the geyser and the stars not in the geyser. Uh, that said, why not? You know, if, if you're into using, you know, st stacking uh, to improve image quality, and you're out there, I think that's a really good use of the time between the eruptions, um, you know, because otherwise you're just standing around waiting for the other eruption. You may as well right. fire off your, your 20 frames for a starry landscape stacker and go ahead and try it. The worst thing that happens is you end up not using them. Remember what the viola settings were? Um, yes, I, I do. So the... So again, we were shooting at 1%, uh, the power was at 1%. Uh, when James and I did our photo, we had the viola set at 3850. Um, we were both shooting at 3850, uh, you know, to, to get a little bit of color in the Milky Way. Uh, and we set the viola to match that. Uh, when we went back with the group, uh, we made the light a little warmer. I think we were shooting uh, with the viola at about 3200. Uh, and again, the camera's still at 3850. Gotcha. Yeah. I'm trying not to talk much because I'm getting echo through your speakers. Oh, oh. so that's fine. So okay. we have this and ah, 
So we have some some nice comments, Catherine. Thank you. Ah, oh, thank you, Catherine. And, and Catherine have... also did us a huge favor of proofreading the blog post on Saturday morning. I I also didn't know that center was a word. Ah. <laughs> Yep, it's a center cone. Cinder. I don't know from a geology perspective why one is one, and um, but a, a cinder cone is is volcanic. It, that's another uh, volcanic term, um, but it is cinder a cinder cone. A S -I -N -T. Limestone. Maybe Sorry? lime based. Maybe it's lime based or limestone based. Yeah, it could be. Hmm. That makes sense. Um, oh, and then Gary asked this. So yeah, you, you could convert the um, uh, the blue one to black and white. Um, the yeah, that would definitely be worth a try. Um, you know, I usually like to when I'm doing black and white, I like to start by thinking in black and white um, instead of using it to fix a color problem. Uh, so I think that's why I didn't think of it. Uh, but there yeah, there, there wouldn't be any reason why you know. If I really liked the steam and the eruption in that shot the best, then yeah, that, that could be an interesting way to, to deal with that. Nice. I bet it would look sharp. I, would, I do love the slight warmness, just slight warmness to the the, uh, the steam on this with the, the perfect reds and the Milky Way. It's, it's delicious. Thanks. Anyway, we, we had a couple of uh, hey, hey, reminders, folks. It's, it's the holidays. Yeah. Wow. Hey. Oh my goodness. Thank you, Sandra. Uh yes. Merry Christmas, Sandra. Merry Christmas. <laughs> Happy Hanukkah. Kwanzaa. All of the good stuff. Everybody. We're hope we hope that you're having a good holiday. And thanks for tuning in. Um I ne maybe next week, if we're doing a blog chat, I'll I'll wear my Christmas sweater. But thank you, Susan, for mentioning my sweater. This is my comfiest sweater. This is 100% comfort right here. Well, that'll be a really good uh, sweater for next week's blog chat um, for the for the topic. So, yeah, keep that one or another warm one handy. Okay. I got that. I will. Uh, oh, good. Echo's gone. Thanks, Paul. All Hi. right. All right. And then, Jay, thank you. Uh, all the credit thank goes you. to Chris. Hey. <laughs> Thanks, Jay. Um, all right. Well, it looks like our, our questions have, have reduced a little bit. You guys can feel free to keep asking. Um, we just wanted to thank you guys for, for being who you are and tuning in every week. Or if you're seeing this on the replay for doing that, um, just going to say the regular thing. If you're enjoying this, you know, tap that like button, uh, leave us a comment or subscribe if you haven't, or, you know, join us on our website and join our blog so you can get our blog posts every weekend in your email. Because some people like to read and some people like to watch and some people like both. So, yep. Um, Chris, thanks again for another wonderful blog post. Uh, what do we have to look forward to that you feel like sharing? Well, uh, Gabe is working on a post that uh, he thought of last year, uh, and that is the importance of the winter solstice for to the night photographer. Uh, and then after that, we're going to have our annual end of the year blog posts where we each share our two favorite photos from 2020. Wow. Yeah. Wow. I wonder if this is going to be in there for you. We'll see. Oof. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> That's funny. So the solstice is Monday night. It's coming Monday night, right? Okay. It is. Yep. So, uh, we have what night photographers should really celebrate, which is the longest night of the year. Not the shortest day of the year, the longest night of the year. Right. So get ready to shoot a marathon. This is when we shine. Yes. Yes, you can yeah. pull out and all of your skills. The, the conjunction of Jupiter and Saturn coming up, too. That's right. This is an exciting month for night photography. And uh, right That's you know, right now we're in the middle of the, uh, the Geminids. And uh, mm -hmm. yeah. December 2020 is a, this is a good way to end the year for night photography. Yeah. Yes, it is. Uh, we, we have one last question dribbling in. Uh, have we had a chance to try the fiddles yet? No, but we're eagerly awaiting. Oh yeah. Them I can't wait. Being received in our fingertips so that we can play with their colors. 
<laughs> yeah. I'm excited to try it. Um, you know, I think the number one reason for me is uh, I, I'm almost always using the viola at 1%. Uh, and yeah. like I said, James and I had to turn it off halfway through the exposure. Oh, yeah. Uh, so I'm excited to have, uh, you know, more power isn't always better. Uh, so I'm excited that the, the fiddle is is dimmer, which is not a negative, um, because there will be scenarios where that is going to be the right tool for the job. Just a little kiss of light. I was I was walking around with my cello the other night here in Catskill. So yeah, uh, <laughs> it's nice. It's nice when you just want like a punch of light. But you know, I, I wasn't doing it in a low level landscape lighting because I'm in you know suburbia. So yep, the fiddle's yeah, good. good. Oh, they're going to be fun. So thanks, Jay. We'll, we'll let you know as soon as we have something to report. So Yeah. I'd say there's a good chance uh, it'll show up on our blog. Mm, maybe. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. So Julianne says she's off for her first attempt at the conjunction scouting. Fantastic. All right, Julianne. Coincides with the solstice. I was talking to Tim about that. So, uh, yeah, Monday night. I know where we're all going to be on Tuesday. We'll come and talk about it, right? Right. So, bring bring your insights. All right. Well, I think that about wraps it up. Okay. Chris, thanks for your time. Thank you, Matt. You're welcome, and thanks to everybody else who tuned in. We miss you, and hope to see you soon. So, have a happy holiday. Absolutely. Take care, everyone. Take care. Uh,